I'm gonna go over the sizes of the cardboard for the size box that I'm making. The box I'm making is a very small kind of jewelry box size or maybe like two macarons uh, size if, if you're doing cookies in them. You can go ahead and alter these dimensions any way you choose. I did give myself 3 8 of an inch thick sidewall. I thought a quarter of an inch was just slightly too thin and a half an inch just looked way too thick. So it's about the thickness of a pencil. The cardboard pieces are going to sit where the blue ink is and this little square in the center is going to be my plug. And so therefore my walls, once I start pouring the plaster, is going to be around this border here. So that is my sidewall thickness. My cardboard is just a single walled corrugated cardboard. So it has only one layer of corrugation in there and then a thin paper top and a paper bottom. I'm making a double walled mold. Plaster is really heavy and when I begin to pour plaster in the center of it, the thinner the wall, the more likely I might get leakage. I just cut two for each side. I gave myself a half inch line down the bottom for leveling which means that's the line I'm going to be pouring to. I drew that on on two short pieces and two long pieces and I'm going to make sure that when I tape these up that that line is on the inside. So the main thing is is that when you draw these lines on you want to make sure that they all land at the same place. Your best bet is to measure from the bottom. That way if you did cut a wonky cut as long as you've measured an accurate line from the bottom base to the top you'll have a good line to use for leveling purposes. Ultimately you pour these molds upside down. What I'm leveling off at the top is going to really become the bottom of the box. I have my four pieces at three by four and my four pieces at three by two and a half, 12 pieces at two and a half by one and three quarter and my base junky bottom. I multiply that by two because I'm going to do two different versions. You can either use clear packing tape to assemble your box or you can use a hot glue method and the clear packing tape is gonna act as a resist against the plaster. And in the hot glue method, I'm gonna have to use some cooking spray as my mold release so that the plaster doesn't absorb and stick to the cardboard. Here we go. So for the tape version, the first thing I'm gonna do is tape up my two sets of sides and making sure that I have that line on the outside. I do wanna make sure that my two pieces are even. And when you are using the packing tape, it is always a good idea to burnish your tape. So go ahead and use a pair of scissors to get the tape good and burnished on there. This is handy when you're packing boxes. Always make sure you burnish your seals because if you don't, it'll bust open and all your stuff will fall out. I'm going to make sure that I tape all the way around the inside of my pieces. Okay, for my insert stack, I'm going to tape up this whole stack as well. The more even you get this, the smoother your inside cavity will be. That goes to say the same about your sidewall pieces. You know, the more accurate you make your pieces and better of a casting you're gonna have. Something to think about. Now you wanna make sure you do a good job covering over any of the spots that any plaster could run into. So I'm gonna make sure I coat my inside core here really, really well. Okay, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tape down this bottom part where the plaster will get poured around the rim. And I'm going to go ahead and secure my core. It's best to probably just cut away your excess. Okay, my inside core is on there. I'm going to go ahead and start taping up my side walls. So as I'm going along, I do want to make sure that my line is facing upright. I want to make sure that in addition to trying to keep this as straight as possible, I'm going to have a secured taped edge all around my bottom base and up through the side. So when I pour the plaster, if any plaster does get into the seams, it'll stop at where that tape is. My taped up version is done. Now my least amount of tape version, because you do need a little bit of for the core. The corrugation around the core part is going to have a bunch of open weave. If you have paper tape, you could totally use the paper tape to tape up the core, water adhesive kind of paper tape. These tapes are going to be 
very vulnerable to water. So plaster, when you mix it, is water mixed up with the powder and that can weaken your mold. The mold release, which is gonna be cooking spray, that should help to repel that water. Now, I won't have to worry about any of that with the packing tape because the clear packing tape repel the water. I'm gonna go ahead and tape together the core. Duct tape would work, but just keep in mind that duct tape does have a bit of a texture to it. You just want to think about the plaster's liquid and it can run into any crevice. So you want to cover over anywhere that it may run into. Hot glue that down to my base. And it's really handy having drawn out that diagram because I know where everything's going to go. And then I do have the double wall thing happening again. So I'm just going to hot glue two of my pieces together first. So now I'm just going to be hot gluing these into my area, my little frame here. I'm going to try and avoid getting hot glue on the inside of my line because if I do that, then when I pour plaster in any of that excess is going to be on the inside of my casting. To add extra support, I can always come in on the outside. Run a little bit on the inside here where the two meet. Running this bead of hot glue all around the outside edge and up the inside edges, that's going to prevent my leakage. If you plan on making multiple boxes, you might want to make the investment in the clear packing tape. In order to get the mold out, I'm going to have to rip this thing apart and tear out all of my cardboard. Whereas with the tape, I could just use a razor and kind of cut away my seams and then just re-smack it back on. Just shoot it with some cooking spray. You could paint it also but cooking spray is usually something everyone has on hand. Your cooking spray may bubble, so you wanna make sure you set it aside and have time for those bubbles to kind of dissipate. Make sure that the area that you're pouring in is a place that can sit for several hours. You're going to need to let the plaster set. Outdoors is okay, and a hot day is okay. You don't want, you know, 100 degree weather, 80s is okay. Also make sure that whatever surface you are working on, if the plaster gets on it, your surface isn't gonna be ruined. I have some wood shims. You can get a whole pack of them for a buck at the hardware store. This is what I'm gonna be using to make sure things are nice and even and level. I have some funkiness happening where the cooking spray left me with these bubbles. So just take your finger and go in and rub those out cardboard piece here is what we refer to as your mold the casting is the object that comes out of it if you are casting a specific something like for example these little silicone rubber molds i have the object in there that i'd be making a copy of that would be called your pattern i'm going to be showing a couple different techniques on how to finish off your boxes one's painting one's carving and the other one is going to be an additive where i will glue on some little bits of plaster i brought out these silicone molds that are for baking purposes but I use a lot of silicone mold in my sculptural work with my leftover plaster I'm gonna go ahead and pour these molds and then once those dry I'll be able to pop them out and glue them onto my box you can use old food containers to mix in it is best to have something that is disposable because any leftover plaster can just sit in this cup and harden off and go in the trash you cannot pour plaster down the sink it'll totally clog your pipes and you definitely don't want a thousands and thousands of dollars plumbing issue Pour your water into the container that you're going to sacrifice. And you have to kind of guess at how much volume of water is going to fill that mold. It will increase in volume once I start adding the plaster. It's not a one for one doubling. It's a little less than double. Once your water is in there, you don't want to disturb the surface of your water. You're going to begin adding your plaster into the water and you're going to just keep adding, shaking the plaster in. Keep your plaster dry. I'm using a plastic spoon to get it in there, but I never let my plastic spoon come in contact with the water. Keep shaking it in here and I'm waiting for a mountain to form. Now there are several different types of plaster you can get. 
The plaster of Paris kind that you buy at the craft store is very fragile, it's brittle. This stuff I'm using is called number one pottery plaster, stronger than the plaster of Paris. And then there's hydrostone. It's a very hard plaster. It's not as easy to carve. So if you're gonna do the carving version, you might not want to go with something that solid, but it definitely is gonna be the most durable option. Plaster, when mixed with water, is a chemical reaction. So if you have very sensitive skin, you might want to be wearing gloves. I am not going to submerge my hand into this plaster to mix it. I will be using a stir stick. Over time, I've developed a sensitivity to this plaster. It wasn't an immediate thing. And now if I go sticking my hand in, the next day I will get a burn rash. I now have a mountain formed. That means that I have just enough plaster in here you go ahead and do your mixing and then once you're sure all your bubbles are good and worked out you're just gonna go ahead and pour it into your mold and I busted a leak see it's all right as long as you have a decent amount of tape you should be good I'm looking at my line see if I need to do any leveling I have light higher edge back here just given a tap, I'm going to go ahead and pour into these guys. If you convert any of your baking items into sculptural use, do not go back to using it for baking. As long as the plaster hasn't fully seized, you can give a little mix up. And then I'm going to add some fresh plaster for this guy. Look at that, just enough. Okay, so these are gonna completely dry and harden over. Safe bet is to give it a couple hours and you'll be able to tell the glossiness of the water will have evaporated and it'll get matte kind of look. While these are setting, I'm gonna start measuring the insert for the lid. I'm gonna be continuing to use the outer edge, but the insert will just go into this and we're gonna be removing the core and replacing it with a new insert. I'm gonna measure a rectangle that is three and three eighths by two and a half. That's pretty good. My core we know is two and a half inches by an inch and three quarters. I am going to play it safe and measure just slightly within that and I don't have to do too much shaving. So the inside rectangle I'm gonna be measuring now is gonna be an inch and a half by two and a quarter. And so I'm gonna start off by finding my center point. Okay, so those are my middle points. I'm going to be removing this inside rectangle. And I want two of these for each one. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat that. Keeping with the process that I'm using for each of these, I've taped up my two pieces out of clear tape and then this one out of blue tape. Okay, so next we're going to start pulling apart these molds. Go ahead and cut from the bottom. And it is a bit messy because I had some leakage, but that's okay. And I'm gonna have to open up one of these sides. I try and do this with as minimal side opening as I can because we gonna have to reassemble to do another cast for the lid. There we go. I think it'd be easier just for me to cut it on open. I'm trying to only cut the cardboard and not mess with my walls here. I don't want to disturb my plaster. This is not fully set yet. The plaster is fairly soft. I can take my knife to clean up some of it. It is still a bit wonky on the bottom. So you can go ahead and just take a sheet of sandpaper and use that. Because this is wet, this is gonna be gummy process to do right now. Be best to do the sanding part once you let this fully dry. At this point with the softness of the plaster, 
it's really easy to do any carving or cleanup that you might want to do. Now, as far as carving tools go, you don't have to have sculptural carving tools. You could get away with making your own. You could take a wooden chopstick and carve out you know, different profiles and use that to carve. You could just get by with using a utility blade and, or an X-Acto or even a cheapy 99 cent store Dollar Tree screwdriver. So I'm gonna set this one aside for a moment and clean off the base of my mold. We're gonna be reusing this along with my insert, but the rest of the core can go in the trash. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the second one and see how well that one did. Now this one you're gonna have to just break apart. And again, we're gonna have that tearing because of the hot glue. And looks like even though I did spray on that stuff, I did get some eating away at the cardboard. So if you are going to do the non-tape method, recommend that you make two sets of these, right? Because this is gonna be difficult for me to do my second casting where I'm gonna be casting the lid for this one. It was a little bit easier removing the blue taped one than it was clear tape. However, that mold is thrashed. Packing tape seemed to work better for the outside but the blue tape actually worked better for the inside core. So there you have it. For the sake of speeding up this demo, we're just going to roll with the bad lid on this one. Too much to do, so little time. Okay, now we're gonna take that insert and it's gonna go at the center at the bottom. Do a little repair here. You're going to be pouring again plaster around the edge and you're gonna to need to gauge how thick you want that lid to be. So add another line, three quarters of an inch from the bottom. I would use a Sharpie for this. Now I can tape up the back end. I'm gonna to have to go back around and reconnect my seal here, but let's move on to reassembling the other one. So for this one, that's gonna go in there, but I'm gonna just go ahead and hot glue that down. Again, don't be like me, make a new mold. I feel like I'm walking into disaster here with this. Do as I say, not as I do. Make a new mold that is not saturated in water. All right, and then after this, I'm gonna go ahead and spray it back up with the cooking spray and pour the new round of plaster. After pouring my lids, I demolded the decorative casts. To separate the large seat, I scored a line and cracked them apart. I was able to do the cleanup with my utility knife and some sandpaper. If you are new to this channel, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps me out. I've taken apart the lid mold and this was the hot glue. It's definitely way more jacked up. One that I did with the tape that's nice and clean. Because I'm gonna be carving into the sides of these, you may want this to be cleaned up a little bit more before you do your carving. I just wanted to show you some basic carving that you could do on plaster while it's at this stage. When the plaster is still a little bit wet, it's softer and it's a little easier to do your carving, but it's not so great for sanding. So let's draw out a little wreath. And I'm just sketching with my pencil. Take the tip of my pencil. I pushed the lead back in, but I can take the tip of this pencil and actually use this for some carving. Now, if you wanna do a lot of heavy carving to make this really three-dimensional, maybe you make your walls a half inch thick instead of making it three eighths. Now you can use a combination of the carving and painting to get your design on here. So I don't have to go too, too crazy we're trying to put in a design because I can paint on some of this. Maybe I wanna come in and add a bit of texture. I'm just using my knife here. You could use an X-Acto. So that's a bit of recessed carving. You can give it a bow. Rather than carving into it and having it recessed within the surface, I'm going to remove some of the outer edge here and make the tree pop up. I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing where I'm just going to dig my pencil in 
All right, let's try out that screwdriver for removing. And as I remove, I could, you know, just leave some of that texture if I wanted it to have this, that looks like a hand carved kind of look, or you can keep it smooth. I think I like this little texture thing that's happening. Y'all know me in texture. Now, if you have a Dremel, a Dremel would be great to use here. You can just throw on a carving tip and go to town using your Dremel to do your carving. I'm actually doing this demo as a twofer here and for you guys on this channel, but also for my 3D class who have very limited supplies and tools. So I want to prove that this can be done with very minimal basic things like this screwdriver your pencil, maybe a razor blade. I'm not gonna whip out my Dremel. I'm gonna do this by hand. Now before I come in and do any kind of painting, I am gonna wanna make sure that my plaster fully sets and dries. You can carve plaster when it is in the dry stage. You wanna wear a mask because you're gonna end up kicking up a lot of plaster dust, which is not good to be breathing in. All right, I think I'll let this guy fully dry. This is just my carving sample. Not as exciting on the wreath, but I like the tree. The next technique, I have my clean box from the taped up one, and I've also sanded my plaster cast. And I'm gonna glue this onto the box, and I'm just using some regular old white school glue. I'm gonna pour some in this tablespoon just to make it easier. I have a palette somewhere, no idea where. Come in and paint on some school glue. And get it positioned where I want it. And that's that. You'll let that dry and then you can, you know, spin it and add another one. It's really important to try and get as flat of a bottom as you can when you sanded those down. So that way you get as much contact around the piece as you can. But pretty much that's it. You're just going to glue up the piece on here with the white school glue. And when it dries, you're good to go. It grabs pretty quickly because the plaster absorbs any of the moisture. Down and hold for a few seconds. I did sand around the sides and break the edges of this one because I knew I was going to be gluing pieces on. This box dried enough for me to get a good sand on. However, it's not quite dry enough for me to do the final paint job. So I'm actually going to end this video here. This is been glued on and it has been curing, but it needs another four or five days in the sun and I need to get this video up for my students. But I'm going to do a second video on how to do some spray painting on plaster and do some finished treatment. So that'll be my part two of this. Hopefully within the next four days, these will fully have that dried out. I can still feel them. They feel cold. And if they feeling cold, then they are still damp. Hope you enjoyed part one of this video. Please like, share and subscribe if you have not done so already. And I hope to see you soon.